Well, good afternoon and greetings once again to all of you who have come for what will be a wonderful <laughs> afternoon um, on behalf of the Racial Equity Task Force of the South Central Synod of Wisconsin. Welcome you to another one of our series of monthly presentations. And today we are blessed to have Dr. Pam Oliver, who is a professor of sociology at the UW in Madison. She's done an extensive amount of work on race, race related to criminal justice, on Oh, I could actually read what she has done. And co <laughs> and the co-evolution of movements of protest and the news coverage to you know, some work on what is called critical mass theory. So some work on protests and the sociology of that, plus lots and lots of work on race, particularly as it relates to the criminal justice system. I hit, was privileged to see her just coincidentally, went with my husband a couple of months ago to um, a diversity luncheon at the UW for the small business, because I had nothing else to do that day, <laughs> and heard her and asked if she would be willing to come to our group, and she was very pleased to come to us, so I'm excited to have her because the maps she showed just had me at the edge of my chair wanting more and more and more. So I'm excited to introduce Dr. Pam Oliver to talk about race and as it has related to this country. Okay. So, so what I'm gonna do is try to cram into an hour material that when I was lecturing to students would be about five classes. Um, so we're gonna go pretty zippy and leave a lot of stuff out, and, and, but try to get interactive about this. Um, at the end, kind of there's a section on trends in immigration, which we may or may not get to depending on what all we've been talking ab about and how bored you are, so we'll just see. So let's, oops, go. So let's, okay. So the first thing we wanna do is just let, ask you, so how do we tell the story of our nation? What's the story? Like, what's the story of this country? Um, white people getting here and how they went west. White people getting here and how they went west. Um, what's the beginning of the story? Columbus discovered America. Columbus discovered America. What's the beginning of the United States? So the revolution, okay. Anything else? I can tell you're not congregationalists. <laughs> the pilgrims are like, I'm sorry, I'm UCC. We're all over the pilgrims. So, <laughs> um, so who are the actors in the story then? They're the white. So when we say we're, so like, what's the language? I mean, you all, you saw the flyer, right? So you know where I'm going with this. But this is like we're warming you up. Like, when we say we're a nation of, Immigrants, and the immigrants are white. Right, okay. Um, so how you tell the story is clearly what you think about the meaning of the nation. And um, I think you're with me. This is, I just, I started trying to jazz things up with pictures and stuff, right? So, you know, the white people come. They recognize the Indians are there, but notice how friendly they are, right? Um, and I keep getting double clicks here when I want one click, so I guess I have to figure out how to handle this clicker better. So um, I'm going to argue the United States is a racial state, that it was um, founded as a government of, for, and by white people, um, people from Europe. Um, American Indians were foreign nations to be fought, negotiated with. They were definitely not citizens of the United States. Um, African slaves were explicitly excluded from citizenship in the Constitution of 1789. And the citizenship right of, rights of free black people were restricted and challenged. Um, and the 1790 Immigration and Naturalization Act um, explicitly said migrants from Europe can become, it was actually, um, it was a very easy process um, for Im white immigrants to become citizens, um, but only whites could be naturalized. And I just quoted the law, just so we're clear. It says, free white person, W-H-I-T-E. There is no messing around with it. White people can become citizens. And the assumption was that it was a white government at the beginning. So why was it created as a racial state? 
Um, why was it a racial state rather than created as a multiracial government of all of the people in a given area? Yeah? So you'd have to share power. What else? It's possible the Europeans thought they were superior. That might be it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The southern colonies threatened to leave the Union, yeah, but later, I think. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, so there's a whole big discussion about slavery and the formation of the country. So um, I'm going to argue that settler colonialism is the reason that, which, so in a way, I'm not disagreeing with what anybody said, but I'm, um, the idea of settler colonialism is a particular kind of colonialism where you come in and you occupy the place and you take over and you settle there as opposed to colonialism um, it, where it's usually thought of where you rule from a distant land and just push people around, but you don't actually move there. Um, and so the United States, also Australia, Canada, South, well, South Africa sort of, um, with settler colonial places where they took over as distinguished from, say, in India, where um, the British ruled for a long time, but they never displaced the Indians. In most African nations, there were um, colonists, but they didn't displace the Africans, right? But so, um, so the land belonged to somebody else. It belonged to Native Americans. And so the only way you could have the settler colonial nation was to displace them. So it's possible they thought they were superior, but they certainly, if they wanted to be there, they had to push somebody else out of the way. Um, and slavery, similarly, the um, African slaves provided needed labor for the European planters. Um, and just a quick recap, there's a ton of research, but in the very earliest years, like the 1600s, um, many whites were indentured and early on, there was kind of blurry distinctions between um, African slaves and European indentured people, but those got hardened so that by the 1700s, um, um, white indentured people were tr being treated differently from black um, enslaved people, and the, and the racialization of slavery happened in the, by the 1700s. So by the time you're coming into what is the United States era, slavery had become racialized. White people in the United States, or in the British colonies in the United States were never enslaved, although they might be indentured. And then um, African people started becoming permanently slaves. It was lifetime, you couldn't get out of it, and your children were slaves. So, um, and even um, as the United States moved into the United States, even free, so there were always um, some free people of African descent, and they also were never treated as full citizens. Um, so the basis of the United States is actually the doctrine of discovery. Um, in the 1400s, the Catholic popes, um, pope, a pope, um, said that the Christian explorers could claim the lands um, that they discovered for Christian monarchs um, if the inhabitants were not Christian. And non-Christians um, could be enslaved or killed. That was the, the pope ruled that. And this is still the basis of the United States claim to this land. Um, that the title to newly discovered land lay with the government whose subjects had discovered it. Um, this doctrine says that indigenous people do have some claims, but that the discoverers have the right to rule and dispossess people from the land. Um, the United States Supreme Court um, in Johnson versus McIntosh, 1823, basically John Marshall said, um, the, the United States had inherited the, uh, the doctrine of discovery from the British monarch. Um, and mo the most recent time the doctrine has actually been cited is 2005 um, in a, a case about the Oneida. And actually it was um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg who actually wrote the, um, the statement citing the doctrine of discovery. So um, there are actually movements calling for the repudiation of the doctrine of discovery. It's a big, bigger deal in Canada as far as I know there's not um, such a strong, uh, among whites, such a strong movement in the United States, but it is an issue. So, um, you know, really, the whole idea of freedom and democracy and everything, in its origins, applied to white men. It was never understood at its time of ever applying to anybody who wasn't white. Um, many of the founding fathers owned black slaves and um, uh, helped to displace natives. Um, 
the ideology, there's this whole literature about how the ideology of freedom really is predicated under the unfree labor of other people and the distinction, the whole notion of white people's freedom was based on other people's not freedom. Um, white wealth, the national wealth, was really built on the backs of African descent slaves um, and on native land. Um, and the whole country was basically built on a racial hierarchy. That just is how it was structured. As a little footnote, I learned from um, uh, Christy Clark Pujara, a historian at UW Madison, it just fascinated me. When um, Wisconsin was first founded as a state, it actually permitted non citizen whites to vote, but prohibited blacks from voting. So, I mean, the whole racial stuff was just up through uh, 1945, was just taken for granted. Um, so, a quick overview is you know, from 20,000 BCE or so to 1491, American history basically has nothing to do with Europe or Africa. Um, 1491 to 1789, I'm, I well, that's the year I picked. That's the European invasion and the African forced migration. It's the colonial period. And then 1789 to 1945, the US is a racial state. Um, and then we can figure out what it is now. So, zipping along. So this is just a, one of many maps you can get on human migration to remind you that um, people started, oops, that's the wrong button, this is the button I want, uh, you know, started in Africa and migrated around. And um, people got to North America. Um, scientists disagree about how long ago it happened, but the earliest, po the most recent possible estimate is like 12,000 years ago, which is before agriculture was invented. So it was a really long time ago. Um, and then I just pulled some maps together. There's a variety of maps that are cultural areas. And the point of these is to remind you that um, people were here and they had cultures and they had countries and they had governments that had nothing to do with Europe. And so here's one. Um, here's another. This one's more Canada-centric, kind of doesn't go down into Mesoamerica. Um, this is another one. Um, just and actually, they don't all agree with each other about how to draw the cultural boundary. But the point is, there's this whole land um, that isn't anything about Europe. Um, this one, what's interesting, it's got all these cultural areas, but notice how it artificially only colors in the areas that are part of the current United States, whereas those actual cultural boundaries crossed what is now the borders of the United States. Um, so, displacement and genocide. And I guess I should say that there's a bunch of, um, uh, this is trigger warning and I'll keep forgetting to do it, so I am gonna be talking about genocide, um, kind of abstractly, but nevertheless, it's pretty horrific. Um, I do have a lynching picture in here, so that's pretty horrific. Um, and so I just wanna alert people, um, because I know depending on your background and experience, it can be problematic to deal with this stuff. Um, so um, sometimes, you know, I say to students, um, lots of times the way it's talked about, you would think that the Europeans arrived and 10 minutes later they were, they were in charge. Like, and it, it was actually a 300 year period of conquest. It took a really long time. And the only reason um, the Europeans were able to do it at all is that disease had actually wiped out a large share of the population and weakened people. Otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do it anyway. Um, there's this whole thing, you know, the the early colonists were like digging up uh, um, indigenous people's graves and using their tools and occupying the farms that the people had died. I mean, so there's this whole part about disease, but it was a 300 year war. Um, and it was the state of the invaders. Um, and really the 19th century, the, the, after the United States is founded, um, it's really a, a century of war. Um, so these are maps of battles, these battles, um, every mark is a battle, and these battles are in the early colonial period, 1521 to 1700. The cluster over here is Spanish, kind of Spanish down in here. Up in here would be the English and the French, and the Dutch, actually, a little bit. Um, these are 1701 to 1800. Most of these are the English and the French, although down in here it's still Spanish. Um, this is 1801 to 1845, so this is definitely the period of the United States um, in here of the Seminole Wars and the um, wars against the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee Wars and stuff. And then up in here is like in the Wisconsin area, um, wars there. 
And then this is um, the, the second half of the 19th century, the wars out on the Great Plains, um, the final conquest of the indigenous people. Um, and so it took a long time. It was a lot of battles. Um, these maps do it by land type. So this is the land claims as of 1783, and the white is the land that had already been ceded that um, the colonists were claiming for themselves and kind of the territories. And if you, you'll see, if you map all these different cultural maps up, they don't all agree with each other about who had what land. Um, so in these maps, um, the dark is land that has not been ceded yet, and the white land is the uh, you know, previously occupied land, and the, color, the various colors are how, how early in this time period the land was ceded. So this is 1784 to 1819. Here's 1820 to 1839. Here's 1840 to 1859. Here's 1860 to 1879. This is the period of the uh, Plains Wars. After the U.S. Civil War, then the, the U.S. really sent its military forces out west to complete the conquest of the um, indigenous people. Um, oops, I keep clicking too hard. So, and this is 1880 to 1972, the last um, sessions. And these are um, present day American Indian reservations. So people went from like occupying everything to occupying almost nothing. Um, and a lot of, there's a ton of American Indian politics around um, preserving the sovereignty uh, around the tribes and the reservations and um, a lot of stuff. So I just had some pictures of the settlers. Pioneers are immigrants or are they invaders, right? And really, um, a lot of these pioneers were Europeans. There was massive European immigration. Um, and part of how the U.S. was occupying the continent was to encourage Europeans to come from Europe and fill all those wagon trains and um, move on out. So um, this is one of the things you can find on the Internet. You're against immigration. Splendid. When do you leave? Right? Um, so why does it keep? Okay, the annexation of northern Mexico, as I said, was zipping through history. Yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Any chance we can dim it? Yeah, what's happening is we're having trouble. Is that better? Yeah, so if you can, it's sunny outside, so we'll, we won't be stumbling around in the dark if we turn off all the lights, actually. Um, can you see better? So you missed all the maps. All right, so... Um, well, there's similar maps. So the annexation of northern Mexico. Um, so the first thing to say, and I, these are my wordy slides to remember what to say, but basically what it's saying is that although the elites in Mexico and in all of the Americas were European invaders who took over at the top, in the Spanish, in the Mexican case, the bulk of the people are indigenous people. Um, Today, at least 90% or more of the Mexican population is of full or partial indigenous descent. And that was certainly true in the 19th century. Um, and um, in Mexico today, actually about a third of the population still identifies with their specific group, not with Spanish or Mexican. Like, it's sort of like, it's not the same, but sort of like the tribes in the United States. I mean, that's, they're, they're very specifically cultural. Um, and Central America is very similar. So we're really talking indigenous people, by and large, when we're talking um, Mexico and Central America. There's also a, some admixture of African descent, because there was some African slavery um, in the area. And there's actually also some Chinese and other people in there, but, but it's predominantly indigenous. So this map is the European claims in 1750. Um, uh, France claimed the middle, the British claimed um, off on the Atlantic, and the Spanish claimed the Pacific. That doesn't mean they controlled all that area, but <laughs> that's what they said they owned. Um, the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, the United States buys land from the French that the French had bought from Spain <laughs> that is mostly inhabited and actually controlled, in this period still controlled by indigenous people. So what the U.S. really bought was the right to fight the indigenous people. 
and try to conquer the land, take it over from the indigenous people. They, the Spanish and the French did not have effective control over most of this land except down by New Orleans. Um, this map is, see, it, it, I just have to figure out how to click this nicely. This is just another map. There's lots and lots of these maps, which are fascinating, but this is just a map, again, showing how big Mexico is. Um, basically, it was New Spain, and then there was the Mexican Revolution in 1821, and it became Mexico. So after 1821, it's Mexico rather than New Spain. Unorganized territory, again, means the U.S. thinks it belongs to the U.S., but it's still effectively controlled by indigenous people at that time. Um, this map is a map of Mexico as of 1824. So you can see where we're going with this. Um, so all of these, th these are the details to make sure I don't forget the facts, but the basic story is first Texas. Texas um, was part of northern Mexico, and white slave-owning Anglo-Americans moved into the area um, with their slaves. They wanted to have slave plantations in the area. Um, and after a while, with its, uh, after it became independent, Mexico prohibited slavery. And so a lot of what led to the um, Texas declaring its independence from Mexico is that they wanted to keep their slaves. So um, 1836, Texas declares its independence. Mexico's not strong enough to stop them, basically. Um, so they're an independent country for a while. And then in um, 1845, the United States annexes Texas as part of the U.S. Mexico doesn't recognize that. Mexico doesn't think it should be part of the U.S. Um, there's a lot of politics around why it happens, which is partly because Texas is looking to expand west, and the United States doesn't want a competing power. They want Texas to be part of the U.S. instead of a competing power. Um, so then um, the, there's a disputed territory, which I'll show you some maps. The U.S. sends troops into the disputed... The, the U.S. wants to buy northern Mexico. So it's trying to buy northern Mexico. It's in Mexico City trying to get Mexico to sell half of its country, but it doesn't want to sell it. Um, and the U.S. moves troops in, provokes a border war. Um, the war happens between 1846 and 1848. Um, there's the war right around Texas, but also out in California. Um, Troops seize control, and um, Anglo-Americans like have an um, kind of overthrow the local government out in California. And there's a war, and eventually the United States wins in 1847. And 1848 is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, in which um, Mexico cedes the northern half of its country to the United States. Um, the treaty is important in Mexican-American history because it guarantees certain civil rights to people of Mexican descent who remain in the territory. Um, and, um, well, we can talk more about that if you want. But anyway, so big chunk. Um, some people say, why didn't... So the U.S. won, but it decided there were three groups um, politically at the time. There were the people who wanted northern Mexico. There were the people who thought the U.S. should just conquer all of Mexico and just, you know, run the whole... There were people who thought the U.S. would basically be the government for all of the Americas. It should just march south and take over everything. And then there were the people who thought it was wrong to do it. <laughs> they shouldn't do it at all, right? So they were debating about it at the time. It was thought of... Many people thought it was an illegal war at the time. I mean, Anglo-Americans thought it was an illegal war at the time. So it was debated. Um, the basic reason for not taking all of Mexico is northern Mexico was not very heavily settled. The indigenous people who were not Spanish speakers still had a lot of power in the area. The Mexicans had not effectively defeated um, the Native American people in the area. Um, whereas farther south, the area was much more heavily settled, and the idea of ha trying to govern a kind of hostile nation <laughs> of people who didn't like you was where they thought maybe they wouldn't do that. Okay, so these are maps. Again, uh, um, and again, the maps are fascinating. So, but quickly, this is a map of Texas and the disputed territory. Um, and Mexico, notice how they just chop off the rest of Mexico in this map. Um, oops, come on. So this is just another map. Um, wait, what did I do here? I didn't get, okay, this is another map um, that shows what I, the reason I put this map in the slideshow is that it shows Indian territory. The other map just kind of left it out. 
But what had happened in the 1830s is that the, the U.S. had actually um, forcibly removed the so-called five civilized tribes from southeastern United States and marched them into what was called Indian Territory and told them that they would actually control that territory, um, that it was going to be their land. Uh, and so the, the, when you take Indian Territory out of the map, it's kind of interesting. Um, and then this is... This is a map drawn at the time that actually allocates all of the disputed area to Texas, so I thought that was amusing. Um, and then this is just a reminder of how much of the United States was once upon a time Mexico. So there's a lot of politics around who has a right to that land? Who has a right to that land? Are the indigenous people who, yes, maybe their specific ancestors weren't living in that territory, they're probably living farther south, but they are like culturally related to the people who were living there, do they have more right to that land than the descendants of the migrants from Europe, right? That's kind of the claim that you can sort of think about. Um, so I just want to remind you that there are other indigenous peoples in the United States or run by the United States. So um, there are Puerto Ricans and Virgin Islanders. So um, Puerto Rico, um, the, the guy whose picture's up there is actually Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who in the 1980s I had in class, um, he went on, I mean, as a graduate student, he went on to be a very famous um, sociology professor, who was the president of the American Sociological Association last year, he's Puerto Rican. Um, it's, a, it's been a colony of the United States since 1898. Uh, Puerto Ricans are descended from the indigenous Taino people of the islands and also enslaved Africans and European colonists. Uh, in 2010, there were 3.7 million Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico and 4.7 million in the United States mainland. Uh, because the U.S. has been running Puerto Rico in a way that really um, has, like, knocked off its economy, and so a lot of Puerto Ricans have moved to the mainland. Um, in 2017, there were 3.3 million people in Puerto Rico at the beginning of the year, but then after the hurricane, more people have left. Um, if, um, oh, I lost... Oh, I, somehow I screwed this up. But anyway, Puerto Rico, um, if, if it were to become a state, I mean, it is larger than 21 states of the United States in population. So there's a lot of people there. Um, and it would be like right in the middle of the distribution of population sizes. It would get five congressional representatives um, and two senators if it became a state. Um, the Virgin Islands um, has 100,000 people living in it, so it's much smaller. Um, but it's, bought, it's a colony that the United States bought from Denmark in 1916, so those people are also colonized. And they are primarily, 75% say they are black, and they're primarily descendants of enslaved Africans. Um, the Alaskans, there are Native Alaskans. Um, there's several different cultural linguistic groups um, in Alaska. Um, that is pretty cold up there, so Europeans were slow to settle there. Russia claimed it for a while. Um, the U.S. acquired it in 1867 from Russia. It, it did impose structures of white dominance in Alaska. Um, by 1930, natives were still a, half of the population. Today, they're about 15% of the population in Alaska. Um, just hang it the wrong way. Hawaiians, they're native Hawaiians, um, who are a Polynesian um, people. And there was a Polynesian kingdom that was there for a couple thousand years. Well, it was... The Polynesians were there for a couple thousand years. They had their own political things going on. It was only uni united as a kingdom, actually, about 100 years before the Europeans got there. Um, between 1820 and 1893, mission U United States Anglo-American missionaries and planters arrived and gradually took over and eventually overthrew the monarchy um, and then um, got, got Hawaii annexed to the United States. Um, part of Hawaiian history is there were a lot of Chinese... Japanese and Filipino migrant laborers in there, and actually the population is predominantly Asian from that history. Uh, Hawaiians are about 6% of Hawaii today, um, and there's a lot of native Hawaiian land claims and sovereignty issues and stuff. Um, there are also the U.S. Pacific Islanders. The U.S. has co other colonies in the Pacific. Uh, Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas have, mm, like, on... I think like around 100,000 people in them total. So they're not very large. They're colonies. They're run as colonies. Um, they're, and the Chamorro people are basically the indigenous people of those islands. There's also American Samoa, 
which is part of the Samoan cultural complex, and there's Samoans there. Um, the the um, Philippine Islands was a United States colony between 1898 and 1945, and there's lots of Filipinos in the U.S. We have a kind of, we still have a neo-colonial relationship with the Philippines. Um, and then there's also the associated free states. So they used to be U.S. trust territories. The U.S. manages their defense. Um, they can enter the U.S. freely. So that would be the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of Palau. These people are Pacific Islanders, and Pacific Islanders are a very small group in the U.S., but they have, like, really wretched statistics. So, you know, we tend to do most of our statistics on black, white, Hispanic, because they're large groups. And I've even heard African Americans say that, well, you know, we're the group with the worst statistics in the U.S., but that's actually not true. That's American Indians. Um, but um, Pacific Islanders and um, also have, like, wretched statistics if you break them out as a group. Uh, yeah? Yeah, so I, I've stared at that a lot. Um, Filipinos, when they were part of the U.S., were nationals, not citizens. You, it's basically where you're subject to a country, but you don't have any rights, kind of. So American Samoans actually can enter the U.S. freely, as can the residents of the Federated States of Micronesia. They're allowed to just enter, um, but they can't vote. They're not citizens. Um, but they can be legal residents, and I think they would be allowed to become citizens, but they'd have to naturalize to be citizens. Um, so they're in this kind of, but their passports are stamped national, not citizen. So they have to carry a U.S. passport, but it's like a second-class passport. Um, other questions? Puerto Ricans are citizens. So the only group that's actually still a colony of the U.S. and not citizens is American Samoa, and I don't actually know why that happened. But Puerto Ricans became citizens in 1917, or were... American Indians, by the way, I didn't put that in, but American Indians... So some people became... Some American Indians became U.S. citizens, some groups became citizens as part of treaty processes along the way. I didn't, like, do the whole treaty shtick. Um, but it was 1924 when U.S. Congress unilaterally declared that all American Indians were U.S. citizens. Before that, U American Indians were not necessarily U.S. citizens. And I will say, uh, American Indians weren't asking to become citizens. It was something Congress did unilaterally. Um, so, like, I didn't do a lot of the politics of American Indians. Um, okay, so <laughs> whose land is it? Do the European immigrants and their descendants have more natural right to the land than the indigenous people of the Americas or the Pacific Islanders. Um, and I, you know, all these groups actually have movements on their own behalf. It's just you often don't hear about them. So it's not that they're not doing anything. It's that it's not making it into the mainstream news that they're doing things. For example, there are... Um, I only learned about political movements in Guam because I had a student from Guam in class one time. He told me about it. And then once he told me, I could go look it up and find out more about it. But I literally, that's how you could say I'm stupid or what. But I mean, I honestly did not know until somebody told me. And so that's what happens with a lot of these smaller groups is there's protests and stuff going on that just doesn't make it into the news. Um, so let's talk about African descent people. There's a movement right now... Um, that may or may not get traction, but the phrase ADOS is around a lot, and that's American descendants of slaves, and a lot of people are fighting about that. One part of the fight is um, they're trying to set, focus on the descendants of America, U.S. slavery um, because it's, an, it's a reparations movement. Um, but a lot of other people, so Caribbeans, people in the Caribbean were also enslaved, but not by the United States, by other people. And similarly, um, Brazil, uh, well, you'll see. Um, so this is, uh, most enslaved Africans were taken to Brazil and the Caribbean. Um, so there's tons and tons, like at least three out of four of all of the people, and other numbers I said, it's 90% of the people who crossed the Atlantic um, prior to 1800 were African, not European. It was just a huge amount of um, uh, slavery. And most of it was going farther south. There's some secondary migration between the Caribbean and the U.S., so a, only a really small fraction of the people from Africa were directly taken to North America. There's some secondary migration. Um, 
I, I'll just skip this. It, it basically says that the um, African people who ended up in North America are actually from a very small number of the ethnic groups in Africa. Africa is a really diverse place, but it was a pretty small subgroup of uh, um, eth African ethnicities who ended up in, as African Americans. Um, so one thing I wanted people to think about, I call the family trees. So most enslaved Africans arrived in what is now the United States in the 1700s. Um, by 1865, the large majority of enslaved people not only had been born in the United States, but their grandparents had been born in the United States, or even their great-grandparents had been born in what is now the United States. So they were, um, the population was growing by natural increase. And um, whereas the massive European immigration is actually later, it's after 1820, is when you really get these hordes of Europeans coming in. And so if you, it's not really, if you kind of think about it, if you imagine like all of a person's ancestors, the average African-American's family, or at least the African part of it, I mean, a lot of African-Americans actually have white ancestors, so that gets complicated, but the, the average African-American family tree has kind of been in North America up, it could be 100 years longer than the average European tree. As you can think about, you know, a lot of racist people like to say to black people, like, why don't you just go back to Africa? And it's like, well, why don't you just go back to Europe? I mean, come on. So, <laughs> the, um, so again, it's this sense of entitlement. Um, who has a right to claim the like, long-term uh, lineage in the place and the sense of being here and the claim on the place? And African-Americans, descendants of slavery, say, we have a claim. We've been here a really long time, and we worked. Our labor built this country, and of course we have a claim on this country, a claim that's a deeper, stronger claim than the European claim. That would be their argument. And that they are owed is their argument. Um, so this is just the um, population map. Um, this is just a reminder. So this is number of immigrants today and in the past. This is percent of population. And so we are just recently returning to immigrants as a percentage of population that was true in the 19th century. Um, in the 19th century, immigrants were always a high percentage of the population. So I'm just going to skip. Slavery was in the North as well as the South. That's what this is about. I'm going to skip over slavery because I, I think most people are going to just stipulate slavery. Yeah, slavery was bad, right? What, <laughs> what I want to talk about is what happened after slavery. Um, so what do you think? I mean, what have you been taught, or what do you think? Was there steady progress towards equality? Um, did nothing happen? Was oppression just consistent? What do you know about Reconstruction and the Nader? So that's kind of what I'm asking. Like, um, you know, what were you taught? Now, how many of you have seen um, Bill Gates? Not Bill Gates. Skip Gates's Reconstruction <laughs> series. So if you've seen that, you kind of know the punchline, right? So. For those of you who don't, so first of all, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's really spectacular. Um, and um, I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to talk about in the next couple slides really quickly. So um, the answer is things got worse and then they, things got better and then they got worse. That's basically the story. Um, so um, 1864 to 5, you know, Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the war, and then um, Reconstruction. Um, Black people were in the Union Army. There's this whole thing about how black people basically won the war. Um, and the story, the short version of the story, is the South needed black slaves if they were going to fight. Somebody had to run their farms. And if, if black slaves, when black, the black enslaved people started saying, no, we're not going to fight, started running away and joining the Army, that was like the end of the Confederacy. Um, and um, so the Union wins. Um, there's tons of violence and conflict in the area. It's just an extremely bloody area because the white southerners really were not giving up. They just kept fighting and vigilantes and they passed the black codes. They tried to re-enslave black people. Um, they tried to use convict labor. So all sorts of bad stuff happened, but also good stuff happened. So after some struggle, um, black people started being allowed to vote and they often did vote and they elected people. They elected black legislators and black local government. Um, and it's important to remember, the thing about democracy, 
So Mississippi and South Carolina were majority black. If you let them vote, they could take over. And the other southern states were between 30 and 50% black. So Louisiana was about 50-50. Um, and so black people, if they were allowed to vote, could have a ton of power in the South. Um, and there was significant black progress on many forms. I mean, black people went out, they started businesses, they tried to get educated. I mean, I mean I'm not saying it was glory time and everything was wonderful 20 minutes later. There was still a lot of suffering. Um, but you could see real signs of progress. Um, and these are just some pictures. So voting rights expanded. Um, there were white violent vigilantes trying to prevent black people from voting, but blacks sometimes did vote in large numbers and won. Um, <coughs> There were black state legislators and local officials, and they did lots of progressive things. Like the public schools in the South were founded by um, these black legislators. And um, they basically had all these policies designed to benefit um, working people generally. Um, this is the picture of the uh, black congressman and the one black senator. Um, I produced these graphs, just are like um, black. Well, they were, these were all men, <coughs> black people in Congress. So there was a period of time where black people were in Congress. And then notice it goes back to zero again. I just to put it in the time frame. So then they don't come back up again, really, until um, the civil rights era. Um, so you get the white counter-revolution after 1877 and the nadir. So there's the Compromise of 1876, which is a bunch of political battles. But the bottom line is um, the <coughs> North agrees to withdraw from the South. They will stop Reconstruction. <coughs> um, and white supremacy will be allowed to return to the South. Um, there's continued and escalated white vigilante violence that's especially directed at black people who are running businesses or running newspapers or otherwise succeeding. And there's a ton of um, this massacres and violence. I mean, there's this huge... There, there are places where white mobs just go kill people, just kill people, trying to drive them out. Um, I'll talk about systematic disenfranchisement in a minute. And this is also when the lost cause ideology gets created. And the, the white South manages to rewrite history. Um, and the white North basically goes along with it. So this whole thing about how sad the Civil War was and brother against brother, and it was really kind of sad and a mistake and we shouldn't have done it. And really, you know, the white Southerners construct this ideology that they were really the moral, upright people. They start denying that the war was about slavery. They start saying it was really about states' rights. I mean, there's this whole package of ideological work that starts happening after 1877. Um, and honestly, I don't know, many of you look at, like you might be as old as I am, I'm not sure, but I, I was literally taught that version of history when I was in public school in California. Um, that Reconstruction was a disaster. This is another part of it, that those black legislators were oafs. There's all these pictures that make them look like monkeys and just being crazy in the legislature, that they were like oafs, that they um, were mismanaging everything, they were corrupt, they were stupid. Um, all that kind of ideological work is being done, like rewriting history is being done during the native. Um, there's systematic black disenfranchisement going on. Um, there's no disguise about this. White efforts, um, that they, the 15th Amendment um, guaranteed everybody the right to vote regardless of race. Um, so this is an attempt to disenfranchise as many people as you can without ever explicitly saying race. Um, so one example is in Louisiana. Uh, in 1895, there were 130,000 black people registered to vote. After a constitution was rewritten, there were only 5,000 black people registered to vote. And it got down to a low of 1772 in 1916. And other states were very similar. They just wiped out the voting rights of virtually all black people. They did it with um, poll taxes, literacy tests, personal and periodic registration, white primaries. Um, there's just all this work that was done to disenfranchise people. And black people basically lost all political power in the South. Um, and the same tools, by the way, exactly the same tools were also used in the North in the same era um, to disenfranchise uh, white workers, especially immigrants. And actually, a lot of white Southerners also got disenfranchised by these same laws. So um, all of these voting laws had the character of really putting the elites in charge and disenfranchising people. 
Um, so this cartoon I got is just, you know, was, uh, there was a lot of discussion at the time. This is a white man's government. It was just one of the Thomas Nast cartoons about how um, there'd been the reimposition of white supremacy. Um, lynching and anti-miscegenation laws are just another example of what was going on. Um, so these are lynching pictures. So there was a ton of lynching during this time. It was really, um, there was um, individual lynchings and then also mob violence and just burning places down. Um, and then also, miscegenation is the fancy word for a lot, people of different races marrying each other. So sex between, you know, like white men were sexually abusing black women throughout the enslavement period. Um, but uh, what these laws were doing is prohibiting marriage, prohibiting, um, and so a lot of laws were passed prohibiting intermarriage. Um, the white columns are basically the states that passed, both southern and non-southern states passed such laws. They were introduced but not passed in the yellow states, and then there was no bills in the pink states. And some of the pink states, they're either New England or they weren't states yet, <laughs> basically. Um, so 1880 to 1920, is uh, the period of virulent racism, what um, some scholars call the nadir. Um, Presidents Taft and Wilson were explicit racists. So in some ways, President Wilson was a progressive, but he, seg he caused the um, Washington, D.C. federal employees to be racially segregated. They had not been racially segregated until he racially segregated them. Um, the Supreme Court guts the 14th Amendment. This is Plessy versus Ferguson. But just the, the court is repeatedly ruling that um, the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, doesn't really require that you treat people equally. It's coming up with all kinds of stories about why that would not be true. Lots of lynching. Uh, s white science is actually justifying uh, white supremacy. So there's all these like um, racist social and biological sciences teaching white supremacy. So there's really an ideological work under the guise of academics that's really defending white supremacy. There's overt racial segregation and exclusion enforced by violence. Part of what this is causing is um, white people are being so violent in the South that it's um, one of the triggers for what's called the Great Migration, where a lot of African Americans moved out of the South and into the North and West, and a lot of that was being caused by the violence in the South. There are black counter trends. So there is black resistance in this period. It's important to say black people did not just you know, lie down and take it without fighting. They did resist. There were boycotts, petitions, speeches, lawsuits, but they basically lost. They did not, they lost their white political allies and they did not have enough strength or power on their own to win. Um, however, there were some black counter trends. There were pockets of development, migration, rise of black schools and colleges, black political organizations. So there's counter trends that sort of set up begin to put in motion the construction of resources and capacities that can lead to um, revolt later. Um, there's this whole period that I'm just listing names of people I'm not going to talk about. Marcus Garvey, the Black Socialists and Communists, the NAACP and its series of lawsuits. There's lots of stuff going on. Like there's, there's no period in American history where there is no black movement. There's always black movements. It's just sometimes they don't win. Um, and then the civil rights era and the black power era, most people have heard of, they know about, they can bring it back to mind. Um, again, I'm just going skip, skip, skip. I'm reminding you, yes, this happened. So there's a ton of change, a ton of legal change. The um, legal segregation in the South gets overturned. Um, the Voting Rights Act, um, the abolition of, you know, schools are not supposed to be segregated, public accommodations are not supposed to be segregated. The uh, Civil Rights Act, 1966 Fair Employment Act says that you can't discriminate in employment, right? There's this whole series of laws passed in the 1960s. Um, so then you have affirmative action, which I'm periodizing as roughly 1965 to 1978, um, where there's, and in this period, there's aggressive promotion of school integration. But I will remind you that at the same time, there's the anti-busing counter, counter movement there's the aggressive attacks on employment discrimination and lawsuits requiring affirmative action remedies in employment discrimination. And again, there's counter um, rebellions by white workers who say, no fair, just because the employer discriminated against black workers overtly, it was proved in court, it's not fair that we suffer because our employer discriminated against blacks. So, you know, there's like this pushback against doing something assertive to um, 
remedy past discrimination. Um, similarly, there's aggressive promoting of voting rights, but then there's a pushback on that, like, no, no, that's not fair, that's affirmative action in voting, is actually what they call it. Um, the um, move to post-racialism happens in the 1970s. 1970s. I mean, it's like the ink is barely dry on the Civil Rights Act. And white people are saying, okay, we're done. Um, so since the 1970s, most whites, on the one hand, so overt support of white supremacy kind of went, it did go away. There was this big, like, discursive change. In the mid-1960s, white Southerners are still saying, look, whites should be in charge. We're superior. But by 1972, even Mississippians are not saying that. Like, it just goes away as an overt ideology. Um, so they say they support racial equality, but they oppose any government action to enforce or promote that equality. <laughs> We're in favor of it, but don't do anything that would actually make it happen. That's basically the majority white position. Um, by 1972, whites were telling, you know, pollsters, the United States has done enough to help black people. 1972. 1974, Gerald Ford, the president at the time, says discrimination is over. It's now up to black people to overcome their disadvantage. Um, 1978 is the Bakke decision, um, Supreme Court decision, which um, basically outlaws aggressive affirmative action in college admissions. Um, it, so if you're, if you're trying to overcome past discrimination, really the most efficient way to do it is quotas. You just say, look, let's get it over with, quotas. <laughs> so the schools were just saying the population's 12% black, let's reserve 12% of the slots in school for black people. Let's just do it, right? And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That was what the Bakke decision said, no quotas. Um, so, um, 1970s to 2010, like, meh. So the black movement continues. The, the, we social movements, people have the term abeyance, where a movement is actually still there, but it's kind of in more of a holding position. It's not winning. It's not in a really um, strong position. Um, you see evidence of some economic advances. The, the economic advances are most pronounced for the middle class people, and, and they were, didn't always start middle class, but for the people who got to college, the people who benefited from that 1970s affirmative action push um, could often pass it on to their kids. And so there was definitely um, benefit of affirmative action. And um, in, by many measures, um, black people who get college degrees show definite signs of progress. Black poverty goes down. I mean, black educational rates are going up. Lots of good stuff is happening. But um, there's also bad stuff happening. There's industrial restructuring in the inner cities so that jobs start departing um, the large cities where black people live. There's the drug war, mass incarceration that heats up in the late 80s and early 90s. There's lots of movements around policing, resisting attacks on affirmative action, Confederate symbols. Like, there's lots of stuff happening. I've been studying that. That's my research project, is kind of study what was going on in the black movement in that period. And there's definitely stuff happening, even though it's not like on the radar as, oh, wow, it's a big mobilization. Um, so getting us into the Black Lives mobilization, um, it did build on long-standing organizations and sentiments, even as it also, some new stuff got created. Um, police violence was an ongoing issue. It was always, I find it in my data from you know, that period of the 90s and the 2000s, it was always happening as an issue. Um, the, the specific sequence of events actually starts with the Occupy movements. Remember Occupy? <laughs> um, so there were some black people active in Occupy in some areas. Um, 2012-13, Trayvon Martin was killed, and there was a lot of attention around that trial, and a whole lot of people started getting mobilized when George Zimmerman was found not guilty. There's a bunch of key organizations that were actually founded the day uh, George Zimmerman was found not guilty. Um, the, in 2014, then protests really start exploding, uh, first around the killing of Eric Garner in New York, and two weeks later around Michael Brown in Ferguson. So you get the peak mobilization, people in the streets all the time between 2014 and 2016. 2016, a coalition of black organizations called the Black Lives Movement for Black Lives is actually putting out a proactive vision statement. It's not just about police violence, it's about a whole array of how to develop um, economically for um, uh, black people. 
Um, they put that out in August <laughs> of 2016. Um, Donald Trump wins in November, and the momentum shifts, right? Um, you still get lots of protests, but the center of it shifts away from black, proactive black protests trying to gain victories um, to a reactive protest and more emphasis on immigrants. Um, so there's ongoing racial issues. I'm now um, looking at the clock. I've been talking for an hour. I have a section on trends in immigration, which I can either do or not do. What's your? Immigration, just some trends in immigration. Should go ahead and do it? Okay, so I'll, I'll try to zip it along here. Um, I mean, the, the point of the previous slide was just that the struggle was ongoing. It never went away. It never went away. Um, so um, Asian folks in the U.S. are mainly immigrants, so they get to be in the story. Um, there were laborers in Hawaii and the mainland, um, and um, Chinese built the western half of the Continental Railroad. Um, there were a large amount of laborers in the west. Um, the Philippines was a U.S. colony, and actually Filipinos were important in the U.S. Um, and then the reason there's so few Asians in the U.S. is because they were excluded, overtly excluded. So the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the Gentlemen's Agreement with Japan in 1907, and then um, Filipinos um, were kicked out after 1934. Um, so the reason there's so few Asians was actually white people were controlling the immigration laws to keep the country white. That's the important thing to understand. Um, uh, this is like a really wordy slide on the immigration eras. I think I'm going to like skip it and come back to this if somebody really wants to get the history. Um, uh, you've seen this slide before. The, 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 um, the dotted lines are actually the key immigration law changes. So what you need to know is that there's all this European immigration, and then there is a backlash against immigrants. In 1924, there's a huge change in the immigration law that basically shuts down a lot of immigration. Um, and it... It's the National Origins Law. It basically favors Northern Europeans and nobody else. Then the second vertical line is 1965's immigration law, which changes everything, and that's where you start getting the different patterns of immigration. So uh, you can see the racial mix of foreign born in the U.S. by year. Um, this is, again, the legal changes. So white, white, white. Um, the white population was actually more foreign than any other race. Um, in the 19th century. And um, then after the immigration law changed, the percent of whites among the foreign-born starts to decline. So it's not that immig immigration, it's the racial mix of immigrants is what's changed. I mean, there's also immigration per se has changed. Um, and so it's the rise in Asian and the rise in Hispanic is the big part of the story. There's some, also some rise in African immigration. Um, and so the, um, this is just showing the mix of Europeans with the 1920s law change. Um, and the racial mix of the total population is changing. And it was already changing anyway, but then it's changing more steeply after the immigration law change. Um, and so these are just showing, um, it's a close-up of just the minorities. So you can see the ri steep rise in Hispanic um, and also the rise in Asian. Um, so this is the Hispanic line. This is the Asian line. Um, down here is the native line, which went up a little bit, um, not a lot, and the black line, which went up a little bit, not a lot. So big changes in the proportion, Hispanic and Asian. Um, region shifted. Um, so the proportion of foreign-born Mexicans uh, went up a lot um, after, uh, so this is like, it's basically one, one line is number and the other is percent of the uh, foreign-born, but basically this is a steep rise in Mexican, Mexicans among the immigrants after 1965. And that's a product both of the change in the immigration law and um, of actually an economic disaster in Mexico in the 1970s. Um, so the big changes in 1965, um, the racism of the national origins law became internationally un unacceptable. The people who wrote the 1965 law intended to have the same effect, that is to only let white people in, but to do it in a way that would be racially less provocative. Um, so they emphasized 
skills needed in the U.S. and family members of people already here. Um, and they added, and this is what bites Mexicans, and now Chinese and Indians, they added the rule that there's a maximum of 7% of legal immigrants can be from any one country. And this is the first time there's a quota on Mexican immigration. Um, and what happens, and they also end the Bracero program, this is overtly targeted against Mexicans. And I was trying to figure out where it came from. As far as I can tell, reading up on it, it the politics of it uh, were to try to protect workers in the U.S. from Mexican workers. Mexico, you might have noticed, is right by the U.S. And there's this long pattern of um, Mexican people tooling their way up to the U.S., working a couple years, making some money, taking it back to Mexico and buying a house, right? Because it's cheaper to live in Mexico. People actually like living in Mexico, but they would come work in the U.S. for a while to make some money and take it back, right? And so this constant back and forth migration was a long-standing pattern. Um, and the 7% cap was apparently designed to partly try to stop that. Um, that 7% cap, as I said, now also affects China and India in particular. Um, and this law is also really important in Asian American history because it opens the door to Asian immigration. Um, at first, there's not very much, but then the family connections start ramping up, and over time, more and more Asians migrate. Um, so there's a lot of changes in the law after 1965 that I'm not going to go into the, for the purposes of this talk. It, it keeps moving. There's a couple of amnesty movements and criminalizing employers who hire undocumented people and stuff. Um, the, the fact, so in the past, Asian people were primarily workers. And so like in 1965, Asian American families were often working class families. Um, today, you can disaggregate because there are poor Asians, but on average, Asian folks have higher income and educational levels than white people. And that's all selective immigration. It has to do with the character of the immigration law about who's allowed in. Um, refugees and asylees are treated differently from other kinds of immigrants. The rise in illegal, unauthorized Mexican immigration and residents in the U.S. is directly caused by lowering the legal immigration quota. Directly caused. You know, like, people want to migrate, and if you lower how much can be legal, that much more is going to be illegal. That's basically what happened. Um, and then um, there's also, uh, this is a more complicated argument, but basically the increased border control, U.S. started ramping up border control, and the harder you make it to cross the border, the more people stay in the U.S., so the old pattern of just migrating back and forth, work a while, go back, work a while, go back, if you make it really hard to cross north, then people just say, well, I'll stay. And so, and then call for their families. And so, um, paradoxically, the undocumented population north of the border actually grew with border enforcement. Um, so there's lots of immigrant movements. Um, there was ongoing anti-immigrant movements and pro-immigrant reactions. Um, been happening a lot. There was significant anti-immigrant legislation in the 1995. Um, there was proposed anti-immigrant legislation in 2005 that led to huge pro-immigrant rallies in 2006. 2017, as you probably can remember because it wasn't long ago, there were huge um, immigrant rallies um, because of um, President Trump's attacks on immigrants. Um, so, summing up, um, racial conflict never stopped. Um, the U.S. was founded on white supremacy and the subordination of others. Um, there's been cycles of pushback and victory for particular minority groups, um, followed by counter movements. So um, what history shows is ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs. Um, and, you know, as people of faith, we can understand where these came from and make decisions about how to respond. Um, this is a saying, I made this up, and it, it turned into an Internet meme, so it's my claim to fame as an Internet meme. Um, if the ancestors cut down all the trees, it isn't your fault, but you don't live in a forest. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is, we all live in the world created by the past, whether we like it or not. It doesn't really matter whether you believe in it or not. It's the world you live in. Um, and we have to figure out what we're going to do about it. So, only went a little bit too long. <laughs> Questions, discussion?
three terms that I hear quite often and wondering what's the correct usage or, or where do they fit, but migrants, immigrants, and refugees. They're really different. Well, I mean, I suppose you could say they're all migrants, but um, a migrant is anybody who moves. An immigrant is somebody who's moving for the purpose of relocating, I think, usually. And a refugee is um, a, a specific legal category. So, I mean, a refugee is running away from something. So one way, um, like, refugee advocates would explain it is a voluntary migrant is going to something. They're moving because they believe they will have better opportunities in a different place. A refugee is running away from something that's a problem and um, often wish they could go home. So that's the big difference. And in international law and also U.S. law, they are different. So the whole immigration thing is like, and I'm not an expert on this. I started, you know, reading up on it because students were asking questions. And I mean, my students in class, a lot of them um, were from immigrant families or were foreign students. So they actually knew more about the law than I did. And so they'd tell me stuff and I'd go look it up and try to figure it out. So U.S. immigration law is just insane. I mean, and have any of you ever, like, studied it? I mean, it, it is bizarre. So there's things like, there are a lot of countries where you can't get in because there's quotas on, you know, how many people can get in. And there's quotas on how many legal immigration tickets there will be every year. So there's, um, and what happens is it kind of resets every year. So it's not like the longer you've been on it, the better you move up in the queue. It's more like every year it resets in a kind of crazy way, which I don't even understand. But, and then there's all these work permits, various kinds. Of, so a lot of people who are here, they're here legally, but they're not, um, they don't have a green card. A green card is a permanent resident. And a permanent resident, um, if you spend five years as a permanent resident or so, then you can um, apply for citizenship. There's a lot of people who are legal, but not permanent residents who are on H2 or H4 visas. And so they have to renew them all the time. Um, so then there's the, the, you know, there's the undocumented people who cross the border. Some most of the undocumented people in the US now actually got here like at least 10 years ago or 20 years ago. They've been here a really long time. There's been much less um, illegal border crossing basically since the economic crash of 2008. Um, the, um, then there's people on, there are the people on these work visas, they're trying to get, many of them are trying to get permanent residency, but they can't. They keep applying for it and not getting it. So there's a lot of kids who are on a dependent visa who've been here like their whole lives, who when they turn 18, they're going to turn into illegal residents because <laughs> they never managed to get a permanent residency. And once they're over 18, they can't qualify through their parents. So that's another thing that's happening. Th if you have a couple million dollars, you can just buy a permanent residency permit. So there's actually this other program where rich people can just become permanent residents. Um, anyway, there's spouse, so um, spousal reunification, like the majority of the tickets are for spouses and family members. And that's its a whole own little process. So there's all kinds of stuff. And then there's special laws for refugees and asylees. So asylum, and again, I'm not an expert, but in asylum, like what's going on with all these Central Americans and stuff, what international law is, is that you cross into a country and ask for asylum. So that's what you're supposed to do, is first you enter the country, and then you say, please give me asylum. And then they do a court hearing to decide whether you can stay. Refugees. Um, in the legal international law sense are actually like there's these refugee organizations that like vet them. They're in refugee camps and they're, um, if they decide to resettle them, they don't actually give them a choice about where to go. They just say, okay, we're moving you to wherever, plop you down. I don't know if I answered the, mm -hmm. comment. Well, unfortunately, I have a large family that are Republicans, and they're always saying things about how immigrants are getting all these benefits from our government. And they're confusing people who come here as refugees who do get benefits from our country with immigrants who don't get any benefits right. from our country. But that's one of the biggest issues that, well, these people are costing us, a, you know, it's a problem. Right. So um, what the big 1995 thing was about was... Um, 
taking welfare away from legal immigrants. And that was actually like a huge deal. Um, particularly, I happen to know, there were a lot of Hmong protests about that because um, Hmong had actually entered as refugees um, and they were being denied welfare benefits and stuff. And the problem is to become a citizen, you have to pass the test. You have to be able to speak English unless you're over 65. And so there were these um, people who were trying to become citizens, but they couldn't pass the test. And then they were being like kicked off welfare. Um, and then undocumented people, there's all the fight about that. So there's a huge fight about jobs. Um, because it's, um, there's some evidence in some places that employers are actually firing black people and hiring undocumented workers. That they, they think that undocumented workers are more compliant and less likely to cause trouble than African Americans. Um, partly because if they do cause trouble, they just call up ICE and get them deported. Um, so there's all that fight about jobs. But um, a lot of undocumented people are working under, you know, fake ID. And I've read an estimate that 10% of what's being paid into Social Security, that seems high, but that's what I read, is coming from undocumented workers who will never get benefits. Um, and it's certainly the case that undocumented people often are paying taxes and are paying Social Security, because if they're working under fake ID, they are. Now, some people are not working, right? They're being paid under the table. Um, and there's this whole, I mean, there are employers whose business model is to hire undocumented people. Um, that is what they're doing. They're kind of intentionally doing it. Um, so, but the whole, um, anyway, it's complicated. But yes, refugees get services. Immigrants, on average, bring money. I was just thinking to, to add another facet to this, this discussion, which is uh, guns. And uh, there's an excerpt uh, from W.E.B. Du Bois talking about uh, communities mostly in southern states where it was, you know, in the 1920s, it's just common to wear a sidearm. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned Trayvon Martin and the George Zimmerman case and uh, I just wonder if you have any con uh, comments or observations about the, the current state of gun control and 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 <laughs> <laughs> and how this also enters into into this discussion, this this backlash that we've seen in the last ten years. So, a couple things. How many of you know when open carry became illegal in California? Anybody know? Yes. The Black Panthers in Oakland, open carry was legal. They were carrying weapons and following the police around legally. Um, and then because they were doing that, the California legislature proposed a bill to make it illegal. Um, and so the Panthers legally carried weapons into the California state capitol to protest <laughs> the banning of open carry. Um, and that's what got them actually national attention. And that's when California banned open carry is because black people are carrying guns openly. So um, the cynical version of this, so Cal uh, Florida has this crazy um, stand your ground law. But notice that nobody thought, the jury was not persuaded that Trayvon Martin had the right to stand his ground. Um, and the concern is that these open carry laws and the closed carry laws and the gun laws are basically being enforced and interpreted in ways that favor white people and punish black people. So that's, uh, um, you know, th the thing that the civil rights workers learned in the South is that black people in the South had guns. And they thought they needed guns. They kept guns. Uh, I heard this, I heard a story, I mean, you know, just the guy told the story, but Martin Luther King apparently had a gun in his, in his living room. Um, and Rosa Parks definitely uh, was raised, you know, her grandfather would sit on the porch with guns and, um, because people felt like they had to defend themselves. So the, um, the gun situation is, A, completely out of control because, I mean, people weren't carrying AK-47s, right? I mean, it's these um, high-powered automatic guns that can kill so many people so fast are just horrific, but um, and there's, 
there are, like Canada has like a lot of guns too, and they don't kill each other, right? So um, there's the guns, but then there's also just kind of the violence of United States society and the racial patterns in which they're used. And but yeah, the I mean the the um, instead of the duty to run away, you know, like to only use lethal force if you need to, that if you can get out of the situation without using legal lethal force, that's what the pre-stand your ground laws are. Is you should only use legal force if you need to to defend yourself. Um, is had been turned into like if you s subjectively feel afraid, whether that's rational or not, you can kill somebody. And it's like, this has gotten crazy, but it's always white people. Like there's not a, you know, a stand your ground, right? I mean, I can't think of a case where a black person has been able to say, I killed this person because I was fearful. Yeah. Oh, wait, you need the microphone, though. Let's see if I can get this. I, I was also, while you were speaking, I was thinking uh, how this dates back to um, Bacon's Rebellion in, I think, about 1660? Right yeah, there? I've read about Bacon's Rebellion, but I couldn't pass the quiz. So well, ba <laughs> ba basically, you know, the 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 white working class um, uh, and and free blacks at first uh, uh, yeah. organize a militia against uh, Native Americans, indigenous folks, uh, and you know, long story short, they 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 become part of the elite establishment. And, uh, uh, you know, it's after that fact uh, that uh, American slavery really yeah. uh, takes off, coalesces. Also, uh, I was just going to add to your point about the American Revolution. Uh, 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 slave population after uh, uh, the American Revolutionary War uh, almost doubles uh, in in about 15 years. So so the United States, as a racial nation, uh, sort of goes along with your thesis here, uh, 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 really uh, uh, is bolstered uh, by uh, by the uh, Federation. I think so. I mean, so the U.S. at its founding was about 20 percent black higher than it is now by a substantial margin. Um, yeah, so, and there's a lot of, like, I've read, again, I can't pass the quiz, but I took a whole, you know, I, there's a huge section of an American social history class I took in the Dark Ages, and I, these debates about exactly how slavery racialized and coalesced in the U.S., there's tons of scholarly debates about that, but um, there's a general sense that elites kind of on purpose created two categories of workers um, that you could buy off white workers by giving them more privileges than black workers. So you enslaved the blacks, and then that any white was better than any black. Um, and that, I will say that that overt practice was part of how Hawaii was run. So um, the planters in Hawaii, actually there's these different Asian ethnic groups, and they uh, racially stratifies what kind of jobs each group had and paid them different pay scales and kind of were disrupt trying to disrupt um, labor organizing that way. So uh, there's a lot of discussion in U.S. labor history about the ways in which um, employers and elites kind of on purpose create racial stratification among workers as part of um, a divide and conquer sort of system. I guess the slide that uh, surprised me the most was the amount of slavery or slaves that were oh, taken from North? Africa to Brazil. Yeah, yeah. And so have they got the same kind of problems we have? So, or so what, or what is their history? Uh, so, um, yeah, th slavery actually didn't end in Brazil until 1890s. Um, Northern Brazil is really black. Like the, the second largest Afro-descent country in the world is Brazil. Nigeria is the first. Um, and so they have a huge racial history. There's a, um, there's a ton of academic work on the racial systems in Latin America. 
And the short version is each country's different. None of them are like the United States. In much of Latin America, the rule uh, would be if you're mixed white, black, you can turn into white. Whereas um, the one drop rule that anybody who has any known black ancestor is black. So there's a lot of really white black people. I mean, light skinned, I mean, even blonde, fair, blue eyed black people um, because of the way race is structured in the US. Um, that would not generally be true in Brazil. You would be, uh, you would lighten into white. Um, it's also true that in much of Latin America, they would often just not talk about race. So Brazil defines itself as a multiracial country, proudly. We are multiracial. We are, and so it's kind of like in Brazil now, there's a politics to say, well, wait, there is racism. I mean, in Brazil, they would say, you discriminate against people darker than yourself, but it's kind of a gradation. <laughs> um, but then there's now a, a movement to get people to call themselves black and to act, and so there's like a new movement for affirmative action in Brazil. And so it's complicated. <laughs> and I am not an expert on Brazil. Um, I also know a little bit about Colombia, which, in which um, the Afro-descent populations are really defined culturally, not by skin color, but by culture. And so it's like um, really different and different places. All of the Americas, all of the Americas, have the same three basic groups, the indigenous people, the African people, and the Europeans. Um, and in all Latin America, all of the Americas, Canada to Chile, white people are at the top of the system. That's the legacy of colonialism. Um, but the details of how it plays out are um, different in different countries and how they talk about it and how they do it. Like in Mexico, officially, they don't classify people by race. Um, so the indigenous people are cultural groups, not racial groups. Um, but now there's a like Afro-Mexican group that says, well, we're actually discriminated against for being black, but if you can't name it, you can't fight it. And so they're actually, there's a group of people trying to call for the recognition of race so that they can fight discrimination, right? And, and so there's, it's, it's complicated and it's not, um, yeah, so the short version is different in every place. But it, the con constancy in the Americas is that indigenous people and Afro-descent people are towards the bottom and white people are towards the top, and that's a legacy of colonialism. It's just, I, and I've had students who just can't understand why that would be true, I don't know. I mean, it's just like, it's basically inherited wealth. Like, it's like, psh, 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 psh. You know, you get stuff from your parents, and so what happened 300 years ago is still actually shaping uh, what the structure of things is now. Just commenting, I was just fascinated once again about that very, very short period of time from um, 64, 65, 66, the passages of those it's like discrimination laws until 1978 and in in that short time, in 12 years, we're supposed to have, yeah, <laughs> overcome yeah. Well, 400 years. I mean, so you talk it's to people amazing. and they're like, well, I mean, the civil rights movement was like more than 50 years ago. I mean, aren't we over it? And I'm like, you know, well, the problem is if we'd like really done it, really done it, just done quotas and like mm -hmm. do it, let's get it over with, like let's do it. Uh, maybe we would be over it. Or at least uh, we wouldn't be over over it, but we could be a lot farther along. Mm -hmm. um, but so quickly there was the resistance to actually doing it that it didn't happen. Um, and, and the rhetoric shifts to uh, a, a fearful rhetoric uh, with respect to uh, uh, crime and drugs. Mm -hmm. Right, the, the the war on poverty becomes a war on crime, and uh, you know Nixon uh, claims to be the law enforcement president, which is also claimed by by our current ad administrator. So one of the um, and I've actually written about this, but so the black riots I think really matter a lot. Um, I think they did scare a lot of white people. Um, and they also like burned out big chunks of cities and stuff. So they were pretty serious. Um, 
the, um, discursively, the white Southerners were trying to call the civil rights movement criminal, but it wasn't really sticking. But calling the riots criminal did stick. And if you read the opinion polls from the time, like people being asked about their opinions, they are asked questions about crime in the streets and disorder that actually uh, conflate rioting with ordinary crime. Um, and so like white, black people basically thought the reason there were riots is that there was discrimination. They might approve of them, they might disapprove of them. Right? There are polls asking black people, so do you think this was a good idea or not? And basically, roughly a third said they thought it was a good idea, and a third said it was a bad idea, and a third said they didn't know, right? So there was disagreement about whether you needed that kind of disorder, but, but most black people thought, well, it's about like discrimination <laughs> and not getting what you need. Um, and, and it was actually police violence was the precipitant for most of the riots. Um, white people either, strangely, thought either it was just crime or it was a planned revolution by the Muslims or the communists, and they actually were not able to distinguish. I mean, the, it's really crazy, but like the FBI thought the Muslims and the black Muslims and the communists were kind of the same. I mean, it's very odd. Um, but, um, so you do get this fearful response, I think, and then you get black power. So the Panthers, um, I read this, you know, I read up on it anyway, but I re more recently read books about the Panthers. And the, the, the Oakland Panthers um, really saw the, especially after Dr. King was killed, but really saw the riots as the energy of the black population. And so that militant black power, um, they were trying to stay legal so th they were trying to like walk the fine line of not actually becoming a revolutionary movement and going underground and trying to blow things up, but trying to be legal but really provocative and willing to use force, like that's what they were trying to do. But it was an extremely popular ideology among black people. And even, I mean, there were a lot of black people who thought it was stupid, right? Don't get me wrong. I mean, black people didn't all agree with each other. They had a range of opinions. Um, but it was a very popular ideology, and they coupled this kind of militant in your face, carry guns kind of stuff with the breakfast programs and these social programs that were extremely popular and they attracted tons of people. And, um, and then they were like violently repressed by the FBI, right? So, um, and the police, I mean, th they were killed by the police, right? So, um, so all of that's going on and there's like interviews from the end of the 60s where there's an old book called Black Lives, White Lives that actually interviewed black and white people at several points in history. And both black and white, a lot of people at the end of the 60s thought there was going to be a race war. And they were, if they were thinking it through, they were worried about it because they were pretty sure blacks were going to lose because there's like not as many blacks as whites, basically. If you go to war, that's probably what's going to happen. Um, but we're very worried about it. And a lot of white people who were interviewed at that time said the reason I'm afraid of black people is because if you treated me the way they've been treated, I wouldn't want to kill somebody. So they were acknowledging the discrimination and the oppression, and that's why they were afraid, is because they figured that um, they could empathize with it and they figured they'd want to kill somebody. So. And th that's what the poll data show from the Times. Like, there's this one poll that had a majority of white people saying they would be willing to raise their own taxes by 10% to help black people. Now, what that means is a little weird, but I mean, in today's rhetoric, you can't imagine people saying they'd raise their taxes by 10% to help themselves, but <laughs> somebody else. Like, so if you raised your taxes by 10% and you wouldn't have to pay anything for health care, it would just be covered, would that be okay? Like, no, I would rather go broke paying for my health care. Like, I mean, it, you know, but, but I mean, and, and so I think there was, for the white population, there's a lot of evidence that, sure, there's the diehard racist, but there's a whole lot of people who could, it wasn't that they weren't afraid and it wasn't that they didn't have some prejudice, but they also understood that society had been unequal and that maybe we'd all be better off if we kind of like moved it in a direction of more equality and just like, you know, got a more just society that it would really be better. And I think there's a lot of evidence of that in the end of the 60s. 
even as there's, you know, also the white backlash. I mean, they're both happening. I think back in um, January, I went to a book discussion and a presentation by Drew Hart, who wrote um, The Trouble I've Seen and How the Church Views Racism. He started out by saying, people say to me, just get over it. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe we would if you'd first get on it and face it. And just thinking about this small group of about 25 people here or so, and um, only two of us from our congregation in Stoughton are here, how do we move beyond, I, I, I found your presentation just fascinating and so credibly real of the whole history. So. I have a 25-year-old granddaughter who has read, read, I don't know, at least 25 books on this topic and says this, if there's any one book you should read and use as a discussion, it is Fright, a White Fragility. I've heard it, I haven't read it yet, but I've heard it's good. And um, so I'm, I'm looking to others in this group to say, you know, how is it going for you in your congregation and how, how have you been able to pull together people to just talk about it, for heaven's sakes? Just a couple hands. Well, I'm from Bethel and uh, <coughs> we got a couple of ideas going after the 2017 Women's Triennial in, in Minneapolis, which some of you may have attended. Um, we had a lot of wonderful speakers who were kicking us down the road in terms of social justice. Um, so we started a book discussion group that meets once a month discussing these kind of books. And in fact, White Fragility is our summer book. Um, we also have a speakers group um, we call it Caring for Social Justice, which is, is, a, is a partner with another group in our church called Caring for Creation. And we bring speakers in two or three times a year for each of those two groups. So there's some discussion going on. And then just trying to let people in the congregation know, like we, we publish these meetings that we have our Synod Racial Equity Meetings. We don't get huge numbers, but there are usually some people here every time. And letting people know of opportunities for them to take action. Everybody's in different spots. So um, anybody who takes a step forward from where they are, that's something. That's how I look at it. And you do it through a million tiny steps. And if you move together and you group with other people who are also trying to make this effort, eventually things are going to get better to some degree. And it's better than doing nothing. I just, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of feeling like we're in a moment where things are actually getting worse. But that doesn't, I still <laughs> think you have to do something, right? <laughs> I mean, you still try to do what you can do, but I'm less of a optimist <laughs> as a personality type. Just to speak to that, that is one of the things our Racial Equity Task Force is intending to do in fall as we plan our program going forward to, because there's lots going on in lots of congregations. So we'll figure out how to get everybody together to talk about what's going on. Um, I, I happen to live in Baraboo. And, you know, we, the people of Baraboo got to be famous this last year because <laughs> of our... One of the things that I happen to be a pastor in Bastabel, and um, what I was so struck by was how willing people were to say these were just young white men um, that didn't know what they were doing. 
they really didn't know what the consequences of what they were doing were. And, and therefore, we should give them a pass. But if you'd had 60 black uh, youth um, doing anything equally um, public, that I'm, you know, I, I think that, I mean, if we want to talk about how we, are, how we can get on it and so that maybe we can get over it, is we have to quit giving passes um, to groups that are demonstrating in, in ways that are not helpful. Um, and we need to call it. I mean, I, I am sort of proud of the Baraboo school systems that they have implemented classes and, and, uh, and, and they are trying to direct it, but that, um, and that it, it sort of ripped a scab off of the community there and allowed them to be able to talk about it because I'm really not sure how it, how it went viral, but um, because it went viral that it really did create a, uh, an opportunity for discussion that we weren't able to have before. Yeah, I think so. I'm also from Bethel, and I wanted to key off of the um, statement that Chris made a couple of minutes ago and Mary's comment as well, is giving people an opportunity to take action. And <coughs> our social justice group has found that to be something that we would like to encourage, and somebody needs to stand up to do that. Coming up the last weekend in <coughs> June, we have several events coming up in celebration of a trip that we made to, or nine of us made to Rwanda. It was a learning experience, it was a teaching experience, and <coughs> I will let our leader in chief here talk about Rwanda weekend itself, but what I wanted to say was on Saturday morning of that weekend, which would be the 29th of June, I believe, we are ho holding an, a three-hour workshop to which we are inviting all different congregations and groups of faith or people who are interested in community development. Because what we saw in action in Rwanda, and which has been proven in many other countries, foreign countries, and also in Ohio, is a method of development sponsored by a group called Faith in Action, in which people are taught how to help themselves to collaborate together uh, to figure out what their needs are to agree on some goal for a particular solution and for everyone to cooperate. We can all identify lots of problems in Wisconsin, in Dane County, in Madison, that if people stood together, we could make a difference. So we would like to encourage various congregations, especially Lutheran congregations, but certainly not only Lutheran congregations, to come together, get to know each other better, and to attend an event like this, like we did the anti-bias workshop a couple of months ago. This is an opportunity to learn how this model works and how we might learn to cooperate with each other and maybe take on a project or a cause or an advocacy in our area to make a difference. So I would like to invite all of your congregations or anybody that you can talk into a three hour on a Saturday morning. I have some flyers with us today and I would be happy to give, oh and, she, and all right, she's already given some out, great. So um, that's my plug and if Those flyers are on the back table, so pick one up when you go out. Can I just say something quick about white nationalists? Very, yes. very, just very quick. So, <laughs> please. Um, I've been reading research about them. <coughs> I mean, they've been around a long time. They went underground. I mean, what the research is that they went underground after the civil rights movement um, and hid often, pretended to be social clubs and stuff so that they could recruit. Um, <laughs> And then they're coming back out in the current period. But um, they're recruiting a lot. I think they're very dangerous. And I also think they've infiltrated police departments in a lot of places. 
infiltrated police departments. I am not saying that all police are racist. Let me be very careful about this. I am saying that the white racists have infiltrated police departments, which is a different statement. And the military, right. I mean, so the military is odd, but yes, also the military. There's also a lot of, um, anyway, complicated, complicated. But I, anyway, I am actually worried about them a lot. So um, I'll just say that. I mean, and, and I do think that suppressing the public expression, so when you suppress the public expression, for the people who've already been converted, they just go underground, right? Fair enough. Um, but it slows the spread to other people because when it's publicly expressed, it makes it seem more ex acceptable and, and helps it to spread. So it's, a, um, it's been happening for a long time. I mean, in the stuff that was just unacceptable racially in the 1970s gradually started coming back in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. You know, so overt public expressions of various kinds of racism has been, has been coming back for a long time, but I just, anyway, that's all. I, I, I think it's important to take it seriously, which is not the same thing to say that every kid who did that salute is a neo-Nazi. Um, it's that some of them were, <laughs> and then others were just kind of going along to get along, and some of the kids were actually resisting. If you look at the picture, there's some who don't have their hands up, right? So um, there's a variation, and people, when that came out, people pointed out they have pictures of like Nazi rallies in Germany where there's this tremendous pressure to get your hand up, but some people's hands aren't up. You know, there, there's, so anyway, it's variation, but I just think it's important, sorry. Uh, um. You were back, the, the Lutherans yeah. were talking about how to get organized, sorry, I, I disrupted yeah. that. <laughs> uh, I, th I really like the idea of us working together, and I think it becomes very difficult maybe more so in Wisconsin, because the white people and the black people are very separate in Wisconsin. It's, I thought of it as an apartheid state, at least when I was younger, especially between rural and urban areas. But um, one thing that I think is a big influence on the segregation that we have is our real estate laws and our income tax, I mean our, our property tax laws. Uh, you know, I used to think when I was younger, why in the world can't we get the schools integrated? Why in the world can't we get neighborhoods integrated? Now in Madison, there are little pockets where mostly black people live, and there, there are low-rent low apartments, subsidized apartments. Um, I, I know it's kind of, if you <laughs> I mean, if you take a good look at it, it's kind of horrifying, really. And big money is being made off of moving people around, um, you know, by realtors and developers. And it's based on these laws that we have. And I really think... <coughs> <that's> <coughs> sorry. <laughs> I should turn off. <laughs> those <laughs> microphones are kind of scary. I really think we need to address those laws. And, uh, of course, wherever you try to whack a bubble, uh, whack something, the bubble comes up elsewhere. But this is one place where it's really coming up badly. And I think we just really need to address some of those laws um, with an outright expression that they are um, both classist and racist, and um, they're really a, a way to keep people down. Uh, you alluded in your biography about having uh, something to do with your, your work in criminal justice. Can mm -hmm. you give us a little background on what you do with that? Um, so in the early two, so my background, my professional expertise in publications are primarily in social movements. But then I um, discovered the huge racial disparity and imprisonment in Wisconsin. I actually got into the issue. I, I literally went to a meeting that I was sitting in the audience that local activists put on. I saw the statistics and I thought, are those urban myths? Are those really correct? And so I started doing some work in that. I volunteered. I was um, kind of hanging out with Madison Area Urban Ministry at the time, and so they had some forums. Anyway, I got involved that way. So my work is involved um, because I am a sociologist and I can do stuff, um, getting a bunch of data on uh, incarceration patterns and then um, 
crunching the numbers and putting together PowerPoint slides and talking to the community about it. One of the things that happened early on is um, I got a copy of the Department of Corrections, Wisconsin Department of Corrections data, basically. It's kind of an interesting, I mean, uh, then State Senator Gwen Moore got it in a Freedom of Information Act petition and asked if I could do anything with it. So, so I had data nobody else had about what was going on in Wisconsin. Um, but then I've gotten involved in, uh, recently less active, but I was on um, local advocacy groups and commissions and boards and the Governor's Commission on Racial Disparities and Incarceration and stuff. And so my role was basically to crunch numbers and put up PowerPoint slides and sometimes be the white lady who talks about race. Um, go to a lot of meetings. Um, so uh, I have this whole other set of, they got kind of out of date and I've, I'm actually in the process of updating them, but a lot of slides about the racial patterns and incarceration um, and criminal justice and that is kind of a moving target. So um, I often give talks on that. I've given over 100 talks on the racial patterns and criminal justice. Um, Uh, yes, Moses has invited me to give talks multiple times. Um, and, um, you know, it's kind of funny. I mean, I was really, really active in the 2000s and kind of into the, around 2010, 2011, I was, like, busy all the time. Then it kind of slowed down. I was doing other things. I, you know, partly I was in administration and personal life and whatever, but I stopped spending as much time on it. And then it kind of heated up. As Black Lives Matter heated up, then I started being called again to come give talks. And so I was often invited to be like an academic voice at a lot of the community forums um, that were being put on by Moses or Freedom Inc. or various other activist groups. Um, and community groups started getting interested in racial issues and criminal justice again. So, um, But yeah, so I, I do those talks a lot. I've got a bunch of stuff on my website that I'm trying to update. So I didn't put my, I should have, I did not. Normally I put my web persona on the last slide and this time I forgot. So I have, um, if you Google Pamela Oliver Sociology, I'm easy to find. The other Pamela Oliver is a sportscaster. So if you just do <laughs> Pamela Oliver, you may get the sportscaster. But if you put sociology, you'll get me. Um, I have two things. I have a website that I haven't updated a lot lately that has a lot of stuff and then I actually, on the, my website, I have a tab labeled blog, blogs, and I actually started a blog called Race, Politics, Justice, and so I've been putting, lately been putting stuff on that. Um, so I do have, I'll start doing more, I think. I just retired, so I'm going to start having more time. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I actually got a grant, so I'm also going to be working on a grant, but I'm going to stop teaching and going to committee meetings. So that should give me more time. N um, one, but it's on uh, math and of collective action theory. So I haven't published a lot on the criminal justice stuff. Um, I have a manuscript that I was trying to turn into a book that for depressing reasons, I mean, I have like several hundred pages of stuff. So there's lots of working, if you want to read like very dense working papers, I actually posted them on my website, but it was kind of unpublishable in its current form. And for sort of a variety of reasons, I never, got it revised into what would make it a digestible book. But um, I was doing lots of analyses of what happened to incarceration in the 90s. And now I have, you know, new data on what happened to incarceration more recently. I mean, the answer, the short version is that it, there was the drug war really, like, shot up the racial disparities, locked up lots of black people. It was just crazy. Um, it still is crazy. I mean, there's still mass incarceration. But since the 90s, um, black incarceration started leveling off, and then it's since 2000, it's kind of declining, but white incarceration kept going up. So the racial patterns actually moved around. Basically, white rural areas um, started having lots of growth in incarceration, and they're basically poor. So poor whites um, became part of the story. So it's, it's like the, it's not that there's no racism anymore, but there's also a story about poor whites um, in the data, and so it just keeps moving and moving and moving. Sorry, who else is? Can you say more about the white nationalism that you were warning us to watch out 
for? So, I mean, really, first of all, I think they're dangerous. They're actually killing people and attacking people. Um, and their ideology is spreading. And I think, and I think we are, I think we, I don't know that we're at risk of a civil war because we're still a pretty strong society, but I mean, a lot of things are fraying at the edges and all these people have guns. And, um, and they definitely, so part of what's happened is there's these different like universes of discourse. Like, um, <laughs> it's actually my husband's cousins, not my cousins, but, uh, well, I, I have a couple of crazy racist cousins too, but, um, <laughs> but, I keep them in social media just so I can read what they're saying. Um, and, I mean, they're not even that, cr I mean, they're, they're not even that far right. They're just in the kind of <coughs> Fox News kind of right, but not the, cra you know, they're not actually neo-Nazis. They actually, I mean, they, they also sometimes post, like, pro-minority stuff, so they're in this kind of strange space. But people are, like, living in these different worlds. I mean, about what's actually real. And what's really happening and what the truth is, is just, and I'm very worried the society's kind of fragmenting. Um, but, um, so the question is, are these neo-Nazis marching around with guns actually dangerous or not? And I think they are. Um, but, and I do think, I do think whites are really volatile. I mean, I think any reasonable history of the United States teaches you that um, white people are really dangerous. And, you know, if you're not, like, really thinking about it and paying attention and aware of racial hierarchies and making sure you pick which side you're on and what you're going to do, you're, it's very easy to get pulled in, kind of over into tacit support for the other side without really thinking about it. So um, it's a hard, hard place to be in. Um, I do think that, as a white person, I think it's important, like, I mean, I have unconscious prejudice, and I'm, I, you know, you can interrogate yourself and realize you've done something that was probably, like, white supremacist, like, once a week or something. Um, you know, and I feel like what you're trying to do is to be a proactive force anyway. It's not like an all or nothing. You're either perfect or you should just give up and go home and watch television. Like, you can keep being self-reflective and paying attention and trying to do what you can, even as you're aware that, you know, you're part of a supremacist system. Um, so that's kind of as a position I, what I think. I think it's really important to be in groups, um, in discussion groups where you talk to other people and you think about what you're doing and you ask yourself, you check yourself. It's also helpful to like, as mu it's hard in Madison, but to keep yourself in dialogue with people of color about what they're saying. Um, for me, it's like I have no graduate students I can talk to. I mean, I have most of my um, friends of color are professionals, okay? Um, and, but then also trying to read things written by people of color, both on social media and um, book books. So like, if you do social media, it's pretty easy if you start friending the right people and are on Twitter following the right people, you can gradually like, change the mix of what shows up in your social media so you're seeing more stuff written by people of color that are linking to other people of color and you can suddenly start finding yourself in a different discourse and be paying attention to what other people are saying. Uh, one thing that has not been mentioned this afternoon is the election of Barack Obama as president of the country. Yeah. Is it your opinion that some of the uh, deep troubles we're experiencing now is uh, a reaction to that of the white backlash in a serious way. Yeah, I think a lot of white people flipped out. And then what happened is you get so you get a certain kind of. I mean, first of all, a lot of white people were like really happy. Now some of them were really happy in a kind of crazy way, like yay, we're all over racism, you know. And so I don't have to talk, you know, like anyway. So that so some people were really happy in this kind of like deluded way, um, but. Um, you kind of could have predicted that it was going to be really hard for a black president to actually do anything for black people. Um, I mean, he tried sometimes, but I mean, sometimes he didn't try, sometimes he did try, but 
Um, every time he did anything remotely black, my God, it was like, <sighs> um, and so, and the backlash was just nuts. I mean, it was like, it vacillated back and forth between he's dangerous because he's black, he's Muslim, he's black, he's Muslim, like, chunk, 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 chunk. You know, but like, um, Rush Limbaugh was calling um, the healthcare plan reparations. I mean, talk about straight up racial rhetoric. And, and so you get all of this. Um, so first, people are kind of nervous anyway. I mean, some people, some people, other people not. But then you get um, just the fanning of it. So yeah, I thought it was, um, and there is evidence that the white supremacist groups like ratcheted up after Obama won. Um, I read stuff that said, so you remember all the Tea Party rallies. So the Tea Party rallies were not organized by the racists. They were organized <coughs> by the Republican Party and kind of the John Birch types, right? The traditional conservatives. Um, but what I read is that the racists were recruiting at these rallies. They saw them as an opportunity to recruit. It's not that they started them, but they were out there trying to use them as a place to recruit people. Question, what is, a, what is the good age to start teaching your children about racism? Because my daughter, she's five, and she already can tell. Mm -hmm. And some months ago, she told me, Mom, why white people are shooting black people? You know, and, and she seemed to, um, she's a little curious. So I, I think that we should pay attention with our children and mm -hmm. grandchildren, because they have an open mind, and they have a lot of questions. And sometimes we think that they are simple people, but they are not. I think that, at least for my daughter, this is a good age. And she knows about mm -hmm. Lincoln. She knows about that he was fighting, you know, for, mm -hmm. for, for the freedom of black mm -hmm. people and what happened to Lincoln. Mm -hmm. She knows about Martin Luther King Jr. So at least I don't know if I'm starting too early, but my question is, what do you think, what is the, the right age to start talking uh, you know, about racism to our children. So children are learning how to classify people by race in this country at the same age they're learning how to classify them by gender. They're learning it really, really young. And they're learning it whether you want them to or not. So like a lot of African-American families work really hard to shelter their children. Um, and to, I mean, so they teach them about race, but they teach them about how to be proud and know who you are because other people are going to try to take you down. And so they're first trying to shelter them from the racist experiences as much as they can and then insulating them, teaching them about race so the kids can learn how to be um, less vulnerable when it happens to them. So if you're a, a person of visible color in this country, particularly African Americans have a long tradition of just knowing they have to do this. White people are more like, Meh. and then, and so then there's like other minority groups who are somewhere in the continuum of trying to figure out what to do. But the kids do learn it young. So, a, a, the, and the research is they're learning it like out on the playground. They're not, it's not like, who taught this kid about, you know, a kid says some kind of racist word and they're like, who said that to them? And it's like, are you crazy? Do you not know what society you live in? Like, <laughs> they're getting it on the television. They're getting it on the playground. Like, of course they're gonna be hearing about race. One story I tell, it, this actually happened. So our son, he must have been about three, because just in terms of the developmental age. Um, it, there was, in his daycare, there were two brothers, one black and one white. Um, and so at dinner one night, he said, boy, it's really hard to tell, uh, I can't remember, uh, I forget their names. Dylan is one of them. I forget the other guy's name. It doesn't matter. Dylan and Wayne, I'll call them, because I can't remember their names. It's really hard to tell them apart. And my daughter's like, ha, 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 ha. I'm like, shut up, right? <laughs> you, know, you don't want them to. So he couldn't, he literally couldn't see race. And then a year later, he was like, um, Dylan and Wayne, they must be enemies because one's black and one's white, right? Um, and at one point, he was trying to invite kids to his birthday party, and he was only inviting the white kids, not the minority kids. And I'm like, I'm not doing this. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. Like, but I tried to talk to him about it. He's like, oh, I just don't like these people. I like these. I don't like them. Oh, I'm not doing this. <laughs> you know? But the, they're getting it on the playground. They're picking it up from the society. So 
And I'm not sure I did a good job with my kids of, of teaching them. I mean, we talked about race all the time because that's what I talk about, but I'm not sure I did. Like, I think I just made them feel nervous necessarily rather than giving them good skills. But, um, but I do think you have to, you might as well talk to your kids about it. And then you're just trying to figure out how, it's not whether to talk about it, it's whether to do, how to do it in age-appropriate ways. So um, lots of times well-intentioned elementary school teachers like really screw it up by doing like massively age-inappropriate ways or trying to reenact slavery in the kindergarten class or something. And like, mm, no, not such a good idea. But so I think there is a big need, and I'm not the expert, but I think there is a big need to like think age-appropriate, like what's the age-appropriate ways to help kids navigate these difficult things. Uh, the kids, by the way, at the same age figure out class. They learn class. They learn who's rich and who's not rich. They, can, they learn to pick up those class cues as well. I mean, they, they really are picking up these divisions in society um, much younger than you would think. Now, and I have to say, they're picking up whatever is salient where they are. So some kids grow up in a place where something's not salient, and they really don't learn it that young because it's not salient. But if it's salient, they're picking it up. I am aware Oop, of our time, time. <laughs> and <laughs> we could go on, I know, much, much longer. But I want to really, really thank you today for this really wonderful presentation. And since you said you haven't wed, read White oh. Fragility, here's our thank you for <laughs> your <laughs> talking to us today. <laughs> Thank you so much for all of what you shared. Thank you again, Brian, and New Life for all of your work in recording this so that you can go back to your congregations for all the people who aren't here, but you know, all of this is usable. It's going to, it's all recorded on the website. And this is our last presentation for this round. We are going to, this summer, we decided to take July and August off and we'll start programming again in September. But keep tuned to what matters because we're planning, we just haven't worked it out yet, but we're planning a celebration picnic something in, in summer, in July and August, where we can sit around and do some of the talking we're talking about today and also do some planning for how do we get um, steps forward because we have a lot of information. We really want to get information to more congregations and we really want to take action steps because this is a scary time and I think as you called us to um, be accountable it is a time when we really do need to be grounded in who we are and we need community for that so thank you <laughs>